Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Uh, we move into rotation uh, today. Most of it's review, uh, but just adding a little bit of calculus here and there. Uh, but most of it should be pretty straightforward. So just a couple quick re reminders. We've got angular displacement measured in radians. Um, and we're going to get into rolling motion, which is a little bit more exciting. Uh, just again, remember, definition of radians um, is the arc length, in this case represented by the, the script L, divided by the radius R. And that'll tell you the angle here in radians. Um, I'm going to skip position versus uh, radius vector. I guess I should mention real quick. If you've got an origin here at the middle and you've got a radius vector that points out here to point P, this R here, the position vector, is not the equivalent to the radius vector for a rotating object. The radius vector is just from the axis to where that point is. Not that it affects us too much. Quick reminder, we could take the derivative of position to get velocity, the derivative of that with respect to time to get acceleration. And then we could, of course, take the second derivative of this to go straight to there. Um, Reverse-wise, we can integrate acceleration with respect to time to get velocity the change of velocity, and integrate velocity with respect to time to get delta x. Uh, forces cause acceleration. Likewise, what's going to happen here is a very similar thing. Um, angular displacement, just a quick note on this. Um, we define counterclockwise as looking this direction um, as being a positive angular displacement. And that's similar to what we do with the, um, if you think about it, most of the time, we call this 0 pi over 2 um, and then pi over here. And so we're positive if we're going in this direction. We're gaining angular, or our angular position is increasing with respect to time. Or, yeah, you get the idea. So average angular velocity is the change in theta over change in time. Instantaneous is as we let delta t approach 0. Um, average acceleration, again, change in velocity. Instantaneous acceleration is that. The same thing is true here with angular acceleration. It's the change in omega over change in time. And the instantaneous is just as you let, let t of Google z or approach zero. Likewise, derivative with respect to time from theta gives you omega, from omega gives you alpha. And or the second derivative of theta with respect to time does give you alpha. In reverse, the integral of alpha d theta gives you d omega. And the integral of omega dot dt gives you the change in theta. What causes an angular acceleration? The answer is, of course, a net torque. So forces cause acceleration. Torques cause angular acceleration. Um, converting back and forth, most of you remember these already. Velocity is just equal to r times omega. And the tangential acceleration, this is not centripetal acceleration, is equal to r alpha. What does that mean? If this object is gaining velocity going from this point to this point, it has an acceleration vector that's acting along this line right here, and that's tangent to the circle or tangent to the circular path. What direction is the centripetal acceleration acting? Well, it's acting always towards the center. What's the net acceleration if you've got an object that's um, where this is increasing with respect to time? Um, you'd have both centripetal acceleration because it's going in a circular path. And if it's gaining velocity, angular velocity, and therefore also linear velocity, it'd have a tangential acceleration vector along this point here. And the net would be, of course, the vector sum of these two at that point. It's hard to draw, uh, but a vector somehow pointing in that direction, the sum of those two vectors. Uh, actually, here it comes real quick. Yeah, for something, I just drew it over here. Sorry, I didn't realize that. Um, so if you've got something in this case where this is increasing, getting larger with respect to time, um, a point P has both tangential acceleration because it's the magnitude of the velocity is increasing. And it also has centripetal acceleration, which in this case is represented by A sub R or along the radius. But you can just think about that as centripetal acceleration, V squared over R or omega squared R. And it's just going to be the sum of those two vectors, which is going to be pointing somewhere right around here, would be the net acceleration if you added these two vector quantities. Good. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, frequency and angular velocity are related. Um, the frequency of a rotation is equal to omega over 2 pi. 
or 2 pi times the frequency is equal to omega. And you might say, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Well, frequency is a number of oscillations per second. So if a wheel goes through one complete rotation every second, that would be the frequency's one oscillation or rotation per second. What's the angular velocity of the wheel? Well, it must be going through two pi radians every one second. And sure enough, it's two pi radians per second. If the wheel spun two times per second, omega would be four pi radians per second. And finally, just again, reminder, uh, period, the time required to go around once is the reciprocal of frequency. So you could also write it um, as 2 pi over the period is equal to omega. Uh, remember, with constant acceleration, we had these equations. What did, if you didn't have constant acceleration? Well, then you'd have to use calculus and integrate. The same thing's true here with constant angular acceleration. The rotational equivalent of those equations are these. Remember the Rosetta Stone from last year? You simply could just plug in, chug, and replace. Um, here's our first quick example problem. A record player is spinning at 33 and a third RPM. How far does it turn in two seconds? First of all, we have to convert RPMs, revolutions per minute, into radians per second. So there's two pi radians in every one revolution. Um, there one minute, which is the bottom here, revolutions per minute is 60 seconds. If you divide that out, we get this many radians per second. So that's what omega is equal to. And then how do we solve it? Uh, the change in theta is equal to the velocity times time. Velocity times time uh, gives us this many radians. The motor shut off, the record player spins down in 20 seconds. What's the angular acceleration? Um, alpha, angular acceleration, change in omega over change in time final minus initial over the time required gives us this, or you could write it as a decimal this way. How far is the turn during this coast down? Um, here I'm going to use this one. Uh, it's like delta x equals v zero t plus one half a t squared, the rotational equivalent, plugging in our initial velocity and our time plus one half our acceleration times time squared. We get this, or you can re replace it or rewrite it as an approximation, 34.9 radians. Remember the vector quantity uh, of angular velocity. So when, if this wheel is spinning this direction, if you use your right hand and bend your fingers this way, your thumb points in the direction of omega. And that's also true for, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but just remember the right hand rule. This gives you the direction of omega. Uh, rolling without slipping, what's going on here? Well, if you look at it, uh, we get some interesting relationships. If you look at it from point P, the point of where this wheel is rolling, um, how fast is the center of the wheel moving? And it's moving with some velocity. Um, or you can look at it from the point of the wheel here, in which case point P seems moving backwards at that speed. Interesting enough, from point C, the top of the wheel would be seen to be moving at V this way. If we use this as our reference point, this is moving at V, and this point here is moving at 2v. Um, think about that for a moment. It's some of the weirdest thoughts, and yeah, depending on which your perspective is, the parts of the wheel are moving at different speeds. Ah, another problem real quick. A cylinder of radius 12 centimeters starts from rest and rotates around its axis with constant ac ac angular acceleration. At t equals three seconds, what's its angular speed, the linear speed, uh, the radial, and tangential components of the acceleration? All right, so solving it. First part, pretty much plug and chug. Um, I'm going to rewrite it this way. Omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t. And it starts up from rest. Alpha is 5, time is 3. It's going to end up at 15 radians per second. And I know most of you could have done that in your head faster. Uh, what's the linear speed? I'm going to use v equals omega r. We know this is 15. The radius of this is 12 centimeters, or 0.12 meters and we get 1.8 meters per second. Now, this last part about the components. So let's take a look at point, uh, this little point right here. Sure enough, it's, it has some triplet acceleration acting towards the center. It also has tangential acceleration along this axis here because this thing's gaining speed. It, the magnitude of the velocity is getting larger with respect to time. So finding the centripetal acceleration, you could use this velocity here and do v squared over r, but I'm just going to do omega squared r. 
Um, so because I already had omega, uh, gives you the same answer either way. Times that, I get 27 meters per second squared. That's the centripetal acceleration acting toward the center. What's the tangential? Well, this thing's undergoing angular acceleration times the radius. Tells us this point is gaining 6 meters per second every second along this axis. Just real quick, if you had to find the net, um, if you had to add these two vectors together, please realize um, what's going to happen here. The resultant is just, sorry, here's A sub C again. So our net acceleration at will be acting this way. And you could find its magnitude because this is a right triangle. Just by doing this squared plus this squared, this tangential, equals the net acceleration squared. Doing that real quick, the net acceleration is 27.7. And yeah, you could even calculate this angle that it's acting at if you wanted as well. Uh, torques, uh, remember that it's, the, it's, the, it's a cross product. Technically, yeah, mathematically, the magnitude's equal to that. But officially, remember, torque, the vector quantity, that's a, that's a really bad tau, is equal to R cross F. Remember, cross product between two vectors results in a new vector that's perpendicular to both of these. Um, and you can sort of figure it out real quick on this one. Uh, what happens if you've got this uh, where the force is not exactly perpendicular? You can, oh, excuse me, um, find the, this lever arm. This is the component of the radius that is perpendicular to the force vector. So if you draw the line along here, line of action, draw this line right in here perpendicular to it, and this is the perpendicular point. Please realize that this is exactly equal to r sine theta. So you can either do the perpendicular component times r, or since that's the same thing here, uh, you could replace r perpendicular with r sine theta times f, or you could just rewrite it as rf sine theta, same idea. Um, just remember how do you do the cross product. If you have to do a cross product, um, the magnitude, I guess I should have put the lines around here, the magnitude of A cross B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them. Um, remember that a cross product of the same dot or one is always equal to zero. And I cross J is equal to K. How do you do that again? You point your, you take your right hand, point your palm in the direction of the first vector. And if you can easily bend your four fingers in the direction of the second vector, your thumb points in the direction of the resultant. In this case, I cross J is equal to K. Um, just a quick reminder, how do we draw ours in this course? We always assume that this is the positive x-axis, so in this case would be positive i. This is positive j. And this dot is our positive k-axis coming out of the board. And so, oh yeah, you should be able to see those real quick. Um, I shouldn't have drawn on top of that. So if you've got those, what do you have to do? You literally have to do the member of the matrix multiplication trick. It's a little painful. Uh, the right-hand rule. Um, a cross B is going to be pointing upward like it's drawn here. B cross A would actually be pointing downward with the same magnitude. Dot product, so much easier. Dot product or scalar product, um, much simpler. Um, in this case, this is a number. It doesn't produce a new vector. And so it literally is just the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine. In this case, I dot I is 1. And I dot any of the other vectors is zero. Um, and how do you solve this one? Remember, you just take the, the, the coefficients in front of each of the terms, multiply them each other. So the coefficients in front of the I terms, plus the product of the coefficients in front of the J terms, plus the coefficients in front of the Z terms, add them all up, and you've got the dot product, um, or scalar product, one of my favorites. Uh, torque vector array mentioned is R cross F. Um, because of that fact, if you've got this force acting this way on this object, here's the radius vector, its pivot point, the torque vector R cross F is going to be pointing in this direction up here. 
It's out of the plane of R cross F. Uh, take a look at this one. What's in that torque? Um, you've got three forces. And uh, the thing I wanted to show you about this one is this 135 degrees always messes people up. But what you've got to look at is comparing the force to the radius vector. Um, it's acting perpendicular. So what's the net torque in this case? Well, first of all, using the right-hand rule, you'll discover that this force here is producing a torque in the positive z direction, or positive k hat. Um, whereas both of these are producing a torque in the negative z direction. They're both trying to rotate it clockwise. That's the other quick shortcut way of thinking about it. Clockwise, rotating something clockwise or accelerating something clock clockwise is negative. Um, something going counterclockwise is positive. Oh, excuse me, I'm yawning. So first of all, working with this 30 Newton vector, 30 times 0.2 times the sine of 90, minus this one, 35 times 0.1 times the sine of 90, minus this one, which is 20 times 20 centimeters times the sine of 90, gives us our net torque, negative 1.5 Newton meters. What does that mean? This object will begin to accelerate in the negative direction. It's going to accelerate in the negative or it's going to be accelerating in the counterclockwise direction. Does that mean it's moving counterclockwise? Not necessarily. We don't know what the initial velocity would be. Uh, torque on a non-fixed object. So if you kick a soccer ball and it, you're dealing with it, how do you calculate the torque? Well, for a non-fixed object, we always work from the center of mass. So if the force is directed right along the center of mass, what is the R vector? The answer is R in this case has a magnitude of zero. Um, and so there's absolutely no torque. What's going to happen on this ball? It's going to or just regularly accelerate this direction, linear accelerate, but its angular acceleration is going to be zero. It's not going to begin to rotate. On the other hand, if you kick it now, what's happening? Well, the force is acting along this point right here. How do you figure out the torque? Well, you could draw in this point right here. And this distance right here would be r perpendicular. And you could very quickly calculate the torque. What's going to happen to this ball? It's going to angularly accelerate in this direction. And its linear acceleration is going to be this way because it has a net force acting on it that way. It's going to get a little spin on it. Uh, take a look at this one. Most of you remember this one from last year. Uh, which one of these forces, if they're all equal, produces the greatest torque on this non-fixed object? And I'll let you think about it for a brief moment before I give you the answer. But the correct answer on this one is this one. Why? Because our perpendicular in this case, which is not drawn very well here, is by far the largest. Um, where does our one equation, I should show you this one real quick. So if I've got a force acting on a mass of mass m at some radius r moving a circular path, we know the torque should be equal to rf sine theta. In this case, sine theta is 90, so I can ignore that. And I can replace force with ma. And now playing it one more step further, remember that um, a is equal to alpha times r. So I can replace this A in this equation with alpha R, which gives me now this. Or rearranging a little bit, I get M R squared alpha. So now take a look at this. So torque equals this thing times alpha. Well, we know that torque equals I times alpha. So what does that mean? It means I for a single particle must be M R squared. And that's where we get the rotational inertia for a discrete mass. It's not great. It's not cool, but it works. For, yeah, and you can use that idea to calculate, for example, these kind of things. Uh, moment of inertia, this is the axis. Assuming it's centered, you could just do 5 times 2 squared plus 7 times 2 squared gives you that. But for continuous masses like these, we actually have to integrate r squared dot times dm. It's the same equation, but we're just breaking the m's into lots of little tiny pieces of dm. Uh, take a quick look at this, first of all, a discrete one. 
those, these three blue dots represent three two kilogram masses. And the question is, if it's rotating all around this axis right here, what's the moment of inertia? Um, it's just going to be the sum of each mass times how far it's away squared. So for these two masses, it's simple. Uh, they're both four meters away. So two times four squared plus two times four squared. The only challenging part is this one right here. But you can sort of realize, oh, Pythagorean theorem, four over four up. Uh, this is four root two. So solving that, you'll discover it's 128 kilogram meters squared for the rotational inertia. Easy. Um, and again, yeah, you, what about for solids? Let me show you. So here it is, uh, the classic one of a disk. So I just want to show you how you solve it. So starting out with our basic equation, I equals the integral of r squared dm. Um, I'm going to take a small chunk of this thing, which is shaded here in red. Um, it's some distance small r from the center. The whole disk has a radius capital R, and the entire mass is capital M. How do I figure out what dm is equal to, the mass of this little shaded area? Well, I can do this by taking the area of that shaded region, which is this piece right here, over the entire area, that be the fraction of this area, times the total mass m. Now, how do I get this 2 pi r dr? Well, think about it. The inner circumference of this, which I'm going to draw really badly, is 2 pi r. And this thing right here is dr thick. If I cut it, chunk, and stretched it out, I'd basically end up with a rectangle that was 2 pi r long and dx thick. And so what's the area of this shaded thing? It's just 2 pi r times dr. And again, you're like, wait, but it really is like this. No, 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 I, I get it, I get it. But remember, we're letting dr shrink to zero. So not a big problem. Simplifying that down, we get that, which means I can now plug it into that integral I had up on top here um, with limits of zero to r. I'm going to integrate all the way from the center all the way out to the outside edge, which is a radius r, r squared. And now in place of dm, I'm going to plug in this whole spiel. Yeah, it's ugly looking. Uh, moving my constants outside, it just becomes that. That's not so ugly. I just need to integrate r squared, which of course gives me r to the fourth over four. And my limit's still zero to r. I'm not going to draw the, you put the zero term in there, which just gives me two m r to the fourth over four r squared, which gives us the very familiar equation, which you probably all know already. For a disk, it's just one half m r squared. Yeah, I know I didn't integrate uh, with a thickness in three dimensions, but I assumed that this, this disk was uniform, so I didn't have to worry about thickness or varying thicknesses. You might remember the other rotational inertias. Um, so we just did this one. You can very quickly solve, this one's easy, um, but we could also do a sphere, a thin shell. In previous years, I've done these because people have asked. Uh, rods are super easy. But if you want me to do this one, just let me know in the WeChat and I'll throw it in. I didn't do it because it's such a long problem. Uh, last time I did it on the board, it took about 30 minutes. So I didn't even want to stick it in the PowerPoint. Uh, finally, just wrapping things up a little bit, a parallel axis theorem and then one example problem. If a particular axis is not in the table, am I supposed to say a particular, we can use the parallel axis theorem, which most of you remember. You look up in the table and find out what the rotational inertia was for that object as if it was rotating through its center of mass. Remember, center of mass is the thing we write through here. And most of the time, that's in the table. And then what we do is we add the mass of the object times how far the axis has moved away from the center of mass. In this case, that's h. Plugging in our numbers in this case, we know that the, the disk through its center is 1 half mr squared. How far did it move away? Well, it's be equal to the radius of this thing. I know it's r sub 0. I'm just going to call it r. So we get this plus that, or the end up, you end up with the rotational inertia of a cylinder whose axis is along one side. It's just 3 halves mr squared. It's incredibly powerful and very useful, and you can solve just about anything. Finally, I just want to use this one as sort of a transition back in again. Remember these kind of problems from last year? 
if you've got both linear acceleration and angular acceleration in the same problem, what do you have to do? You have to do simultaneous equations. You've got to do F equals MA and you've got to do torque equals I alpha. Unfortunately, in this case, it gets rather ugly fairly quickly. Well, first of all, uh, what are the forces acting on this mass? Well, we, of course, we've got the force of gravity, mg, and we've got the tension acting this way. By the way, that same tension is acting up here, which is what's causing the torque on this disk to cause it to angularly accelerate. Uh, this net force is causing this to linearly accelerate downward. Plugging or solving it real quick, over here, the net force on our mass is mg minus the tension equals its mass m times a. And that's about as far as we can take it. What about for the disk? Well, the, the torque on it is equal to the tension times the radius. That's not tau anymore. That's tension. Equals its rotational inertia. It's 1 half mr squared because it's a solid disk times any angular acceleration. Oops, that's in the wrong order. Sorry. You remember that you can actually rewrite alpha as A over R, regular acceleration over radius. So we're taking this, you could rewrite it that way. And if we do that, we end up with the tensions just one half M A. If we take that and stick it back in our original equation over there, um, you can solve for the acceleration, uh, moving things around just a little bit. You can factor out the A from both of these terms over here. So mg equals a times m plus one-half m, capital M this time, make that more obvious. Um, and you can multiply through by two if you like, and you can calculate the acceleration is actually that. And you're like, holy cow, that was a lot of work. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, but what we can do is this. Once we know the acceleration, we can plug it in right here. And solving for the tension now is pretty straightforward. We end up with that. Um, what's the velocity? I didn't do this one. My apologies. I literally ran out of room. Do you remember V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2A delta X? We know the acceleration. If we plug in H, we could solve for the final velocity. It's just going to be a, a large number of variables involved. All right. Let me just check the next slide. I, I think that's as far as I wanted to take you. Yeah, we'll save it there. Have a wonderful night. Good luck with your homework. Um, oh, I was going to do an AP problem. I'll save that for tomorrow. Um, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.